Last during conference, I talked about this exact two-sphere partition function of supersymmetric gate theory called the gate linear sigma model, and also discuss about its applications in string theory when this gate linear sigma model flows to the nonlinear sigma model on Calabria space, namely the conformal field theories. So after that, we have much more progresses along that direction, such as hemisphere partition functions and real projective two sphere partition functions and elliptic genera of the supersymmetric gate theory developed by these people. So in today, uh, I'm going to talk about, in particular, this hemisphere partition functions and RP2 partition functions, and also discuss about the application in string theory, such as D-brain and orientable plane in Calabria space. So let me now start, uh, let me first start with some motivation of this work, which is given by this gentleman. So in the last string conference, there was a very nice talk by this gentleman, Dave Morrison. And during the talk, he made a very interesting comment on the D-brain charge, which I quote here. So basically, he said, there are several mathematicians, including this gentleman, who, pr who recently proposed that the modification of the D-brain charge, which is given by these expressions. However, this proposal was very confusing to me uh, at that time for many reasons. So in order to understand what this modification really means and how to, understand, how to resolve the puzzles I had, which I also want to discuss today, I studied this hemisphere partition functions and RP2 partition function of supersymmetric gate theory in more details. So to understand this issue on the D-brain charge a little bit more clearly, let me first introduce this history a little bit. So let me start with this minimal coupling of the D-brain to the round number gauge field, which can be written as the following form. M is the world volume of the D-brain, C is the round number gauge field, and Q is the round number charge of D-brain, what we'd like to determine. As many of you already know, there's a long history to find the correct form of this Ramon Ramon charge of the D-brains. And this anomaly inflow mechanism has been very useful to highly constrain the possible form of this Ramon Ramon charge. So people study this anomaly inflow in many different settings, such as D-brain on top of each other, intersecting D-brain, and so on and so forth, studied by these people and really many others. And at the end, the D-brain charge inferred by this anomaly inflow is given by these expressions. This is the charm character of the field old volume field strength and NSNS2 from gauge field. In addition, we have a square root of the A-roof genus of the tangent bundle over A-roof genus of the normal bundle, where this A-roof genus is given by these expressions. We can do the similar thing for the central R, uh, the ramon ramon charge for the oriented pole plane from this anomaly inflow, which is given by these expressions. The first term is very important for the TED for cancellations, and we have a different characteristic class called the Hilchberg class given by these expressions. Furthermore, by computing the disk amplitude with the Ramon Ramon vertex, people actually confirm the first few terms in those two expressions. And finally, these two expressions are consistent to the Dirac charge quantization conditions. So everything nicely fits into each other. So once you find this Ramon Ramon charge of the D brain and the oriented pole plane, it seems quite straightforward to write down the central, uh, central charge of this D brain and the oriented pole plane in the Calabria space, at least in the large volume limit, which is given by these expressions. Here, J is the Keller to form of the given Calabria, uh, given target space, and Q is the Ramon Ramon charge of the D brain and oriented pole plane, which are given by these expressions. So this is well established story, beautiful story and people believe that this is the end of the story. However, as I told you earlier in this talk, there are several mathematicians, including this gentleman, who recently basically say the central charge formula of the D-brain in the large volume limit is indeed incorrect. And the new expression proposed by the, those mathematicians is given by these expressions, which involve new characteristic class called a gamma class rather than a roof genus. So here, this gamma class is defined by the Euler gamma functions in this way. And recently, this Japanese group confirmed that this new expression proposed by those mathematicians is indeed correct from computing the exact hemisphere partition function of the gauge in the sigma model, which I want to discuss today. However, this new expression is really confusing in many reasons, for many reasons, in particular, when I look at this large volume central charge expressions, it's quite likely to take 
this part as a new expression of the de brain charge, which is different to the conventional one. So then the obvious question we can address at this point is that whether or not this new expression satisfy anomaly inflow conditions, Dirac charge quantization conditions, and many other physical constraints. But surprisingly, all the answer to all of these questions turns out to be yes. But still, identifying this expression as a new ramung ramung charge of the D-brains seems very problematic. This is because, by definition, this gamma class contains imaginary term. Therefore, both ramung ramung charge and the vestibular coupling of the D-brain should contain the imaginary term, which seems to break many good physical symmetries, such as CPT invariance. So I was totally confused at that time, and that was my motivation to study this hemisphere partition functions and RP2 partition function, um, functions of the supersymmetric A theory, which I want to discuss today. So before that, I first quickly go through the uh, hemisphere, par uh, sorry, the two sphere partition functions. So today, I mainly discuss about this gauge linear sigma model, which is two, two dimensional supersymmetric gauge theory that involve vector and chiral multiplet. In particular, I will focus on the gauge linear sigma model, which flows to the uh, nonlinear sigma model in the Calabria space. <coughs> in this gauge linear sigma model approach, the Keller moduli of the Calabria space can be realized as a complex phi fi parameters, and the complex structure moduli can be realized as a parameters in the superpotentials. All right, so let's now put this theory on the two sphere. As Jaume explained, the supersymmetry on the two sphere is given by SU2 slash 1, which can be parameterized by those clean spinners, epsilon and epsilon bar, satisfying these two equations, where L is the radius of the two spheres. Then, by adding some cor suitable correction terms, which are suppressed by 1 over L, you can easily write down the supersymmetric Lagrangian on the two spheres. Uh, so we have a supersymmetric A theory on the two spheres. Then using the localization technique, we can compute the exact two-sphere partition function, which is given by these expressions, where W is the vial group of the gauge group. Oh, sorry. B is the quantized flux, because is a five parameter, theta is a two-dimensional theta angle. And finally, we have a one determinant contribution from the vector multiplet and the Carter multiplet, which are given by these expressions. It is very important to note that this two-sphere partition function is independent of the gauge coupling constant, which guarantees that this two-sphere partition function of the supersymmetric A theory at UV actually compute the two-sphere partition function of CFT at IR fixed point. And as John makes beautifully explained, this two-sphere partition functions will compute e to the minus k, where k is the exact Keller potential on the Keller moduli space of this Calabria manifold from which you can compute the exact geometrical metric on the space of 2, 2 superconformal field theory. And this exact metric contains all kinds of worship instant and corrections. And one way to understand this formula is that we can squash this two-sphere <coughs> without changing the partition function result. And in the infinite squashing limit, we can finally relate this two-sphere partition function as an overlap between this canonical ground state, where this canonical ground state can corresponds to this identity operated tip. And this particular overlap is well known to compute this e to the minus k, where k is the exact Keller potentials. So let's now move on to this uh, hemisphere partition functions of the supersymmetric A theory. So we first need to construct a supersymmetric theory on these hemispheres. It's not that difficult. We just need to start from supersymmetric theory on the two sphere and the cut the space by half. But this is not the end of the story because we have a boundary of these hemispheres. So we also need to consider some boundary data. So what are these boundary data? We first need to impose either Neumann or Dirichlet boundary conditions on the various fields of the theory. And second, in order to preserve two supercharges on these hemispheres, we also need to consider some boundary interactions. More precisely, we have to uh, introduce the charm pattern vector space on the boundary, and we need to introduce a certain formally operator acting on this charm pattern vector space called the tachyon profile. And this tachyon profile satisfies these relations where W is the superpotential of the theories. So this equation is known as the matrix vectorizations, and the solution to this equation is not unique. So depending on this choice of the tachyon profile satisfying these equations, you can end up with a non-trivial boundary potential, which is given by these anti-commutation relations. So to get more familiar with this boundary data, let me discuss how to describe this D-brain in this cartoon. 
obviously, uh, we, we should impose this Neumann boundary condition on the scalar field, describing the tangential direction to this D-brains. But for the scalar field, describing the normal direction to this D-brains, we have two options. First, we, need to, we can impose the Dirichlet boundary conditions for this scalar field. Well, this is very intuitive, and this is what we learned from the textbook. But sometimes, this description becomes very subtle, especially when these three brains are wrapping on some manifold, which is not spin, but spin C manifold. And the subtlety is known as the free Witten anomalies. So, but due to the lack of time, I won't discuss more about the subtlety. The message is, due to the subtlety, in the modern different language, people prefer to use the second descriptions, which is the following. So here, we impose a Neumann boundary condition, even on the scalar field describing the normal directions. And then consider some tachyon profile, which can provide a non-trivial boundary potential. And this boundary potential can be minimized exactly where this D-brain is located, which can be summarized by this equation. So this is a kind of dynamical way to impose this uh, Neumann boundary conditions. And since this is a kind of physical process, any sort of thing describing this D-brain can be automatically taken care of. Finally, from the two supercharges conserved on this hemispheres, we can show that this D-ring has to wrap on the holomorphic cycles. Then, so we have a supersymmetric theory on these hemispheres uh, with a certain boundary data. And then using the uh, localization technique, we can compute this, oh, 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 compute the exact hemisphere partition functions, which is given by this result. Here, W is the uh, vial group of the gauge group. Tau is the complex by F5 parameter, which is given by this relation, F5 parameter, two-dimensional theta triangle. We have a contribution from this boundary degrees of freedom, the charm pattern vector space. And finally, we have this one determinant, which is given by this expression. So this is an exact answer. And similar to the two-sphere partition function story, we can if, uh, argue that this hemisphere partition function will compute the overlap between this canonical ground state and the boundary state which is well known to compute the central charge of this orient, uh, D brain in this Calabria space. And this is an exact formula in alpha prime corrections, which contains which instant and correction, uh, which instant and correction. So to be more concrete, let me think about the simple example, which is the D brains in this Calabria space embedded in the CPM minus one manifold. So let me now uh, start from this gate linear sigma model that corresponds to Calabria manifold, which is given by this U1 gate theory, coupled to n chiral multiplet of electric charge plus one, and a single chiral multiplet electric charge minus n. We also need to introduce a phi parameter in the two-dimensional theta angle. And finally, we have to add to the theory the following superpotential, which is given by P times the homogeneous polynomial of x of degree n. So in the case of n equal five, this Calabria manifold becomes the famous quintic threefold. So let me now start uh, with, from this D brain wrapping on this entire Calabria space. So using this exact formula in the previous slide, we can easily compute the exact hemisphere partition function of this particular U1 gate linear sigma model corresponding to this Calabria manifold, which is given by these expressions, and this is the integration contour. So this is exact central charge of the uh, central charge of this particular D brain, which contains alpha prime corrections. Since we, are in, since we are interested in the uh, geometric phase of the gate theory, we can set f prime parameter positive so that we can close this contour to the left, and then we can evaluate this integral as the sum of the residue at those poles. And one can further argue that the residue at this negative pole corresponds to the non perturbative correction to the central charge because they contain this instantum factor e to the minus two pi c. On the other hand, we can identify this residue at the origin as a perturbative correction to the central charge which is given by these expressions. And then by taking the large volume limit where this F5 parameter goes to infinity, we can suppress this version instant and corrections. And using this toric divisor of CPM minus one space satisfying these relations, one can finally rewrite this expression into the following form, which is the central charge of this particular D brain in the large volume limit. And as you can see, the gamma, cl gamma class indeed appear rather than a of genus. We can do the similar computation for the lower dimensional D-brains, wrapping some holomorphic cycles in this Calabria manifold by considering this tachyon profile and the boundary potentials. And at the end, one can show that the central charge of this orient, uh, lower dimensional D-brain in the large volume limit is given by these expressions, 
uh, again, the ratio of the gamma class appears rather than the ratio of the A roof genus. So somehow this result confirmed this new expression proposed by the mathematicians, and it's quite confusing result. And at this point, one can naturally ask the following questions. Do we need a similar modification for, uh, in the case of the oriented fold plane? So in order to answer that question, uh, uh, let me study these RP2 partition functions. First, we need to uh, construct a supersymmetric theory on this RP2 space. It's again easy. Just start from the supersymmetric theory on the two spheres, and then impose the parity projection condition on the various fields of the theories where this parity will map a point on two spheres to its antipoda point. More, pre more precisely, we will impose the following parity projection condition on the scalar field, describing the tangential and the normal direction to this orientable plane. And then we can show that among the four supercharges on these two spheres, on this RP2 space, the two supercharges can survive. And from those two supercharges, one can show that this orientable plane has wrapped on has to wrap on this holomorphic cycles again. It is also important to note that on this RP2 space, this two-dimensional thin triangle has to be either zero or pi. This is because otherwise the topological coupling on the two sphere will break the parity symmetries. And these two values, zero or pi, will distinguish two different kinds of orientable plane, O plus and O minus plane. So we have a supersymmetric theory on this RP2 space with a certain parity projection conditions. And again, using the localization technique, we can compute the exact uh, hemisphere, uh, sorry, this RP2 partition function of the supersymmetric A theory, which is given by these ex uh, ex uh, expressions. W is the file group, this is a five parameters, and we have two one determinants determinant around two different kinds of supersymmetric set of points, one, one of which is called even holonomy, and the, uh, the other is called odd holonomy. This is because on this RP2 space, we have a discrete holonomy group along the non-contractable cycles on this space. And these two only determinants are given by these two expressions. And the relative sign between them will be fixed by this value of the theta angle. Then similar to this two-sphere partition function and hemisphere partition function case, we can argue that this RP2 partition function will compute the overlap between the canonical ground state and the cross cap state which is no also known to compute the central charge of this orientable plane. And this formula is again our prime set. So let's now consider this uh, simplistic example again, this orientable plane wrapping on this particular Calabria space embedded in the CPM minus one manifold. Using this exact formula, one can easily compute the exact uh, RP2 partition function of this particular U1 gate theory corresponding to this Calabria manifold, which is given by these expressions. And since we are interested in the large volume limit eventually, we can set a five parameter positive so that we can rewrite this integral as the sum of the residue at these poles. And by taking the large volume limit of this Calabria space, we can ignore, we can separate this non perturbative corrections and left with this perturbative correction to the central charge of this orientable plane. And using this toric divisor of the CPM minus one space, we can finally obtain these expressions which is the central charge of this orientable plane in the large volume limit. And again, the gamma class appears rather than the Hirschberg class. We can do the similar computation for the lower dimensional orientable plane wrapping some holomorphic cycles in the Calabria space, considering different parity projection conditions. And at the end, we can obtain the central charge in the large volume limit, which is given by these expressions. We can reproduce this important factor for the uh, tetpole cancellation. However, this ratio of the gamma class again appears rather than the ratio of the Hilgeberg class. So this result tells us that we need a similar modification in the central charge of this orientable plane. It's again another very confusing result. So I think now we are ready to discuss how to understand these modifications and what's the physics behind that. So to do that, we first need to understand how much this new expression is different to the old and conventional expressions. So let me first start with the central charge of the D brain in the large volume limit which is given by these expressions. So using this identity between the gamma class, one can easily factor out this conventional form of the central charge of the D-brain, and this is the deviation factor. Let's now move on to the central charge of the orientable plane, which is given by these expressions. Using this identity between the Adolf genus and the Hilgeberg class, we can easily factor out this conventional form again, and surprisingly, we have the same deviation factors. So let's now take a closer look at this common vector, which can be nicely summarized into the following form. 
So here, it is very important to note that all terms, all terms appearing in this exponent are purely imaginary. This is very important. And second, in the case of the Calabria, of three, Calabria manifold, we don't have this first term. So the correction from this gamma class starts from the sixth form. Second, this correction from the gamma class actually depends on the topology of the entire target space rather than the topology of the sub-manifold or cycles that this D-brains and oriented for plane reference. It strongly suggests that this correction from the gamma class has nothing to do with the properties of the D-brains and oriented for plane, but has something to do with the entire target space itself. And finally, when I look at this, sorry, <coughs> these expressions, we can find another term, e to the minus ij, which are common in those two expressions, whose exponent is again purely imaginary. So, based on those three observations, we strongly suggest that this correction from the gamma class has to be understood as an alpha prime correction to the volume of the Calabria space, which can be summarized into the following expressions, rather than the modification of the Ramunamu chart of the D-brain and the orientable plane. Indeed, we have one more evidence that supports this claim, which is the two-sphere partition functions. It is shown by these people recently that in the large volume limit, these two-sphere partition functions can be written as the following expressions, where you can find the same factors. And here, it's very natural to identify them as a correction to the e to the minus ij. Furthermore, square. yeah, it's square. Yeah, I mean, before it was square root. So. so furthermore, in the case of the Calabria 3, from this expression, you can obtain the following two terms. The first term is nothing but the, color, uh, the volume of the classical volume of the Calabria space. And the second term that involves this Euler number and zeta of three, this is very well known term as a pathologic correction to the volume of this Calabria three, which has been computed in this nonlinear sigma model in late 80s by these people. So everything is nicely fit into each other. So we strongly suggest that this correction from the gamma class has to be I attribute it, uh, has to be understood as an alpha prime correction to the volume of this Calabria space, and it's perfectly safe to use the old and conventional form of the Ramung Ramung charge and the fast terminal coupling without any further worries. So let me summarize. So we discussed this hemisphere partition function and RP2 partition function of this supersymmetric gate theory, and from which we can compute this exact central charge of this D brain and oriented for plane wrapping, this whole, wrapping on this whole of cycles. From this computation, we can confirm the appearance of the gamma class, but the correction from this gamma class has to be understood as a quantum correction to the volume of the Calabria space rather than the modification of the ramung ramung charge. And furthermore, from this exact hemisphere partition function, we can reproduce the very subtle factors in the D-brain charge, which is associated with, associated with the spin C issue, which has been proposed by this Minazi and Moore. And ev everything I told you today is consistent to the Horiba-Famira symmetries. So thank you. That's all what I want to say today. <laughs> <laughs>